when he was president, and I had been advising the government of India, and uh, I had this role as uh, the chief advisor to the government for innovation. And I was just told that that's my, my role, and, um, and I remember asking um, at a cabinet meeting, uh, this very quiet, you know, sort of severe Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, well, what do you want me to do? And he suddenly sounded like my mother. He said, innovate. Um, so I, I, we talked about innovation. We talked about working with Israel. And I talked to Shimon about this idea of bringing, creating a, 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 a relationship between um, Israel and, and India about bringing technology and science from Israel to solving large-scale problems such as water use, et cetera, to, to uh, Israel. Shuman thought that was a great idea, and so I brought two um, Israeli, I mean, Indian cabinet members. We sit in his office, and there's very serious-looking Indian <laughs> cabinet members, and we sit down, and Shuman looks at them and says to them, do you know what a Jew is? <laughs> and they, whatever reason, they both look at me. <laughs> and he says, what are you looking at him for? <laughs> you can look at me. And then he describes why this would be a perfect relationship. He goes, the Jews really understand suffering. And India, Indians traditionally really understand, you know, calmness and, you know, this, you know, acceptance and fate. And, and we don't at all. We have no calmness, no acceptance. This will be a perfect marriage. <laughs> they look very puzzled. <laughs> now, I, 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 um, I see from the, the uh, uh, title that I'm supposed to talk about uh, cancer and exactly how to make this transition. I'm not sure, um, <laughs> other than I know that Amos is deeply interested in, in all aspects of genetics and, and, and these things. Um, so I'm just gonna talk really briefly about something that for me, who's worked for many decades in cancer, um, is really quite extraordinary. I've given thousands, maybe tens of thousands of speeches or talks about cancer over four decades, and until the last year, never ever did I include the word cure in any title. Um, we didn't, it's not that we didn't cure a few cancers, and some rare cancers, the testicular cancer. Uh, we learned gradually to cure one type of leukemia in children over many, many years with, by the way, no science. There was not a single discovery or insight that guided the cure of 90% of kids with a, a type of, the most common leukemia called acute lymphocytic leukemia. And now, I think, without any drop of what I view as my rigor and scientific uh, desire not to um, overclaim things, I think we can talk about the cures of cancer. And it's really, really extraordinary. Um, in 1994, when a new young president, Bill Clinton, asked me whether I would take on this role of sort of the cancer czar in the United States, um, and you know, he asked me, you know, can we cure it? And uh, you know, I said, I don't know, but not without trying. That seemed like a really brilliant statement. Um, and you know, he just sort of looked at me wondering, you know, is this really the right person? Um, you know, and, and he asked, well, you know, if you could promise that we can cure it in 15 years or 20 years, we can use that to get a bigger budget. And, and you know, I just said, I can't do that. And we went back and forth, and we were negotiating. He said, well, triple your budget <laughs> if you can cure it in 15 years. I said, no, I, think, I don't think I can say that. He goes, well, double it if you can do it in 25 years. I, said, I don't think you can do that. And he said, well, well, well what, what can you tell me? And I said, well, look, why don't you just ask me, why don't you do everything you can 
meaning you, the community. And I said, call me in every week and let me convince you we are moving as fast as we can, but no faster, but no slower. And I don't know if we cure things in five years or 50 years. And it is interesting though, this idea of cure for cancer, you know, has been, it's a metaphor you know, for a great achievement. What do you want to do when you grow up? You, you know, or it's in novels, this, you know, futuristic novels, when cancer was cured, in looking back at 2030 or something like that. Um, and, you know, cancer has become not just a common disease, and one of the most common ways, particularly once cultures are wealthy to die, um, but it is a metaphor. It is our metaphorical disease, and we use malignancy, a cancer on this and a cancer on that. It is, it is a powerful and extraordinary, of course, collection of diseases um, that in many ways reflect our health and the fact that we, life, biologic life, is about the ability to make mistakes and the failure to fix mistakes in the recipe book that we call DNA. One of the metaphors that's usually used for DNA is a, a blueprint. Uh, um, I'm sure some people have heard that. By the way, it's incorrect. Scientists use it all the time. It's not a blueprint. A blueprint is something you can look at and see. This is a recipe book. Um, and the recipe book, it's the recipe book for the entire complexity of going from a single cell to what we all are. And the reason we all look different, the reason we exist at all, the basis of evolution is that the copying of that recipe book is flawed. And the causes of those flaws are, yes, there are some toxins, some are more powerful than others. The single most powerful one we know about is tobacco, sunlight, but mostly it's oxygen and iron. Mostly, it's when you try to copy three billion letters in 20 minutes, you make about 100 mistakes. That's not bad. And you corrupt most of it. We edit ourselves. But still, mistakes happen. And those mistakes accumulate. If they accumulate in a single cell, you get cancer. Um, what I've just told you sums up 100 years of research in cancer, trying to figure out what the hell is it? What is cancer? And it is a disease of genetic, genomic, which is the, what we call the collection of all of our DNA. It's a disease of genomic instability. It's many different diseases with certain shared characteristics. It's, it has, we all know it's been extremely hard to successfully treat, extremely hard. So let me describe two recent breakthroughs um, that give me, a, you, know, you know, really for the first time, a tremendous amount of, uh, of optimism about where we're going. Um, and, you know, at, you know, for me, just personally, spending seven years being responsible for the U.S. and, and in fact, the majority of the world's funding for cancer research, um, it, 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 it felt like this constant burden. I will tell you one story that sums up that burden. There was going to be a march on Washington to demand more money for cancer. And I was going to speak at it, um, and I did speak at it, 350,000 people on the Mall of Washington. But the evening before, there was a big 
know, something or other, you know, in, 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 at, in Washington. And I was introduced to speak to the gathered, you know, um, uh, dignitaries about cancer by General Norman Schwarzkopf. I don't know if that name is familiar. He was called Stormin Norman, and he looked the part. <laughs> and he got up to introduce me, he was very enthusiastic. He had prostate cancer. And, um, and he said, now let me introduce Dr. Rick Klausner. He's the general in our war against cancer. <laughs> it's up to him. <laughs> now this year, just in the United States, we will lose 500,000 people. That's all the men I had under my authority in the first Gulf War. And then he starts and looks at me and goes, imagine if I lost all 500,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I would have been court-martialed. I would have been thrown out of my job. I would have been hanged. And he has his arm around him. <laughs> The pressure has been on. <laughs> so why am I optimistic? Well, the first is a new approach to therapy, by the way, that's been talked about for over 100 years, and with virtually no um, progress. And that is this dream of using your own immune system to destroy cancer. And, and many brave scientific souls toiled in that um, remarkably unproductive vineyard. Um, and it, with, with really virtually no real progress. <clears throat> Endless stories. This person's tumor suddenly went away. But they were all just anecdotes that could not be reproduced, not that it was wrong, and never be tied together. And all of that began to change in the last three or four years. And it's really extraordinary to see. What we learned is that the immune system can see your cancer. But, like with everything else about this awful disease, this literally brilliant disease, sees the immune system and just shuts it off. Some, it shuts it off a little bit so you know, get other illnesses, but much more importantly, it shuts it off to itself. It sees the immune system seeing it, and it turns it off. And we didn't know that. In, in retrospect, sort of simple and obvious. And we've begun to learn how to turn it back on, how to take the tumor's breaks of the immune system off and unleash it. Um, about three years ago, I um, started a company and it was based upon work that I had done over 30 years ago when I was still in the lab and discovered how immune cells get turned on. And we just combed all the genes and discovered all the genes and, um, uh, and found the one gene that had all of the information that tells an immune cell to either be on or off. And um, uh, I sent these clones around including to a wonderful Israeli scientist, Zeli Eshar. And Zeli had this wonderful idea that once knowing that a piece of that gene turned immune cells on, what if we made an artificial chimeric gene that had basically an antibody that saw the tumor on one side and then was connected to this thing I very cleverly called the zeta chain. Now, 
you may laugh at that, but I didn't know the Greek alphabet. And, you know, we, we discovered um, that there were six chains and, you know, I, I knew Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and then I got <laughs> stopped. <laughs> but luckily, this was before the internet, I was able to find someone who knew that Epsilon and Zeta came next, and that's why the Zeta chain has <coughs> got its name. And that's, that's the key. And with this company I found it that's called Juno, it's a marvelous company, it has five or 600 people now, 30 clinical trials, and, and what we do is we take patients' own cells and a very specific type of cell, which actually is a stem cell of the immune system. That was the key. And then we do, outside the body, gene therapy on those cells. And we put Zelig's type of chimeric antigen receptor, it's called a CAR, chimeric antigen receptor, and if you get that exactly right, you can put that back in an individual, and that will now see the patient's tumor. And what are we seeing? We started with leukemias and lymphomas. There's a reason for that I won't go into, but that's what we've started with. We treat people that have weeks left to live. I mean, you know, we've talked to the young physicians and please, you know, these people can't, you know, you gotta find someone a little healthy. But, and by and large now, with one injection, 90, between 90 and 100% of the people with severe, deadly leukemia go into complete, complete remission. There is nothing you can find. That takes about 10 days. In fact, for the first time in my life, I've sat with patients who were loaded with tumor, who have two kilograms of tumor, and they're searching for metaphors for what did it feel like in those three days that it disappeared. What is it? What is the feeling? Two people came up with, it's like ice melting. And they go away. We've now added lymphoma to that. There we're about 70%, what looks like complete cure. And we are seeing almost no relapse, which, I mean, I have been in this business for a long time. I've never seen anything like this. The way you know it's working, actually, you don't even have to see the patients now. You just go on to the wards and observe the oncologists. Oncologists usually are not, you know, they don't have a skin in their skin. These do. You can measure the outcome by, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely extraordinary. And we don't think the tumors will come back because, because we put in stem cells, they create their own offspring, which are permanent memory cells, the same way permanent memory cells remember that we were vaccinated as children. It's just really extraordinary. And last week, for the first time, we began treating two patients with solid tumors, one with lung cancer, actually three patients, one with mesothelioma and one with breast cancer, we'll see. There is no reason now we will not be able to expand this to all cancers, but it will be more difficult. It's gonna take time, and, but it, 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 it is just extraordinary. And that's new, that's a, it's an absolutely new world. Um, there is another approach that let me just tell you briefly that um, I'm involved in. And this is a project that recently announced and launched with Google and Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, and it's called Grail, after the Holy Grail. Um, the Holy Grail in cancer, actually, is not to cure it, even though that's the you know, common view. The Holy Grail would be to find it when it's really early when it's curable. The interesting thing is, for solid tumors, we know how to cure it. It's 
called surgery. I mean, you cut it out. But you can only do that when the tumor is really small and localized. So the, this dream has been, well, why can't we? I mean, we can detect things, you know, 44,000 light years away. I mean, we can't detect a tumor of a million cells, a thousand cells. So let me tell you a story. And that is two years ago, I, I part-time joined a company called Illumina. Illumina is this company that makes sequencing machines for DNA and has totally revolutionized everything about measurements for medicine. And the board and the CEO of Illumina asked me, what would I do if this was my company? And I told them there was no future because um, eventually it'll be a commodity and, you know, and, and they said, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd turn it into a health company as opposed to a research tool company and in the following ways. And it was great. You know, he just said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but that's exactly what we want to do. So <laughs> why don't you come and do it? Um, and so, so I spent two years helping Illumina attempt to transform itself from a research tool company to a clinical company. And literally, the first day I was there, a pathologist who worked for Illumina, um, Illumina had bought a company that developed blood tests to replace the process of amniocentesis. This was a blood test called non-invasive prenatal testing. And what it is, in the, the mother's blood, first of all, we find the mother's DNA. Interestingly, DNA is in the blood. Turns out that's gonna be one of the most important discoveries. It was made in 1948 and completely ignored for 30 years because I believe, because it was published in French. <laughs> and even the French didn't. <laughs> um, but it was quite incredible. So it turns out, in, in the maternal circulation is DNA from the mother, and a tiny amount, maybe 1% of DNA from the fetus. Just about 1%, sometimes it's 2%, it's different. Turns out DNA sequencing is so precise that by sequencing deeply and counting all the <coughs> chromosomes in the blood, you can find out whether that 1% is made up of the correct number of 46 chromosomes from a chromosomally normal baby, or 47 who's Down syndrome, or 45. And you can do that with 99.9% .9 accuracy. It's just extraordinary, and that's just sequence, sequence of interest. So this now test, NIPT, is used all over the world. It's, it, it's the most rapidly taken up test in the history of molecular medicine. I'm sure that means over. It's true. Anyway, this pathologist, was reading these results and she called me, I had known her from years before, and she said, we've done 150,000 of these tests. Can you hear me if I'm not? There's a microphone there. There's a microphone on the table. There's a microphone on the table. On the table. Standing still is not my strong suit. Um, no? Okay, I'll say, I'll, I'll say. So, Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'll go back to the beginning. So, um, they had done 150,000 tests and they had 14 weird results. She said, can I bring these to you? Can I show them to you? And she did and I looked at them and, um, and there's an old saying that if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Okay, so I'm a cancer person. And I looked at it and I said, well, these women have cancer. And that was interesting, that's certainly possible. So we traced back. We found 13 out of 14 of the women's physicians who had ordered the test and found out that no, none of these women had cancer. Would you look? 
all of these women had cancer. They didn't know it. Everyone. And 150,000 tests that did not show a false positive. You have to understand about how we screen for cancer. Mammography, 90% of the positives are false positives. They're not cancer. Lung cancer screening, 96% of the positives are false positives. It's a disaster. Here we had something that looked like the false positive rate was less than one in 10,000. By the way, just from the statistics that we know from epidemiology, that was about exactly the right number, small numbers, of cancers that we would have predicted if we picked up everyone with cancer. I can't really say we did or not. But this tracing that showed these women had cancer and they didn't know it, of course, got us to think, wow, is this the path to that holy grail? Now the problem at the time is every one of these women that were diagnosed with cancer and they didn't know it had late stage cancer. So we began, I put together a research group and to make a long story short, we figured out how can you use this test to not just measure late stage cancer, but early stage cancer and the answer is we can. It takes a level of sequencing that no one's ever done before. Um, I'll give you an example. These NIPT tests that I told you when we discovered this, we will do, I'll just say, six million reads. You don't have to know what that means, but the number is six million. To achieve what we need to achieve for this, we think, holy grail test, we've now approached the point where we think we need three billion, and we can do it. Also, when we started this, the Human Genome Project had reached the point that there was an agreement that an accurate call of a single letter of the genetic code has to be good to about one part in, um, in, in a thousand. We've realized and that's the standard for quality DNA sequencing. We realize for this door, we need to improve that to one part in 10 million. We've done that. So with this, in this January, we launched this company called Grail. Um, and it's important that it's called Grail, because um, remember, no one actually ever found it. But the quest was always viewed as being worthwhile, and that's how we feel about this. Um, we hired, um, we're going to be generating more data than has ever been generated. It blows away what's on Facebook or Google. And in fact, the CEO is a person that ran three little projects for Google over the last 13 years, Google Ads, Google Apps, and Google Maps. Was that? And then he co-ran Google X with Sergey Brin, Jeff Huber. Um, and he, I mean, he's an amazing person. I got to know him two years ago, and within a week, I hate this, I don't think this was a connection, but his you know, beautiful young wife, beautiful <coughs> kids, she's 44, and she was diagnosed with end-stage metastatic colorectal cancer. And he and I and Laura went through this, and she died last November. Jeff knew we were planning Grail, and when I hugged him at the funeral, he whispered to me, I'm joining Grail. And that's the feeling we have about this. Um, we, this company will set up the largest clinical trials network that's ever been put together, public or private. Um, and, you know, if this is right, there will be an annual blood test that basically says you either do or do not have curable early stage cancer, at least that's the dream. So I think between the immune system suddenly figuring out to unleash it and this idea of the ultimate molecular stethoscope, which is what this, this is, I think the future of cancer finally, to me, does look like 
it will be a very bad future for the disease and a very good future for humanity.